great. Uh, so I think uh, we can get started. Uh, so welcome everyone uh, to a webinar discussion on advancing a development-centered climate policy at the International Monetary Fund. My name is Sarah Jane Ahmed, finance advisor to the vulnerable group of 20 ministers of finance, the V20, and I will be moderating today's discussion with closing remarks from Mary Lou Uy, director of the Secretariat of the Intergovernmental Gov Group of 24 on International Monetary Affairs and Development, the G24. The latest IPCC assessment report released in August 2021 has officially confirmed that due to inadequate global emission reduction measures, the 1.5 degree limit of the Paris Agreement may be breached this decade. Severe climate impacts originally thought to be more long-term will thus materialize much sooner than expected. In short, Climate change is now in a constant state of acceleration. This spells economic and financial destruction and devastation for the world's most climate vulnerable developing countries. Yet climate and multilateral finance continues to fall short of country requirements. There is a need to tackle the global market failure of the climate crisis while adding vitality to a just and sustainable recovery, including to deliver, to deliver resilient economies in today's highly interconnected world. And with that, I'm excited to announce that this webinar is the launch of a new research collaboration of eight global institutions forming the Task Force on Climate Development and the International Monetary Fund to advance a development-centered approach to climate policy at the IMF. Member organizations and co-sponsors of today's event include the Intergovernmental Group of 24 or G24, the vulnerable, the vulnerable 20 Group of Finance Ministers, or the V20, African, Econo African Economic Research Consortium, Boston University, Global Development Policy Center, Center for Social and Economic Progress, Financial Futures Center, National School of Development at Peking University, and the United Nations Economic Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean. Over the last 18 months, the task force will engage in and utilize rigorous empirical research to inform policies that align international financial stability and growth with global climate goals. Today, we discuss the task force's inaugural publication, a strategy, a strategy report proposing the key elements and guiding principles for a development-centered approach at the IMF to help facilitate green, just, and climate resilient transitions. Um, so as uh, with that, uh, I could perhaps move to the next session, which is uh, to give an overview uh, and introductions of the speakers. Um, so as the only multilateral rules-based institution charged with promoting the stability of the international financial and monetary system to enable longer run growth, the IMF can enable a fit for purpose initiative of the Bretton Woods system to enable a just and sustainable recovery to transition to a low, low carbon and climate resilient global economy. In July, the IMF released a policy paper outlining its strategy to help member countries address climate change related policy challenges. The first step in devising how the fund will mainstream climate change into its work. This is a welcome action, especially in the context of the sobering UN appointed intergovernmental panel on climate change report released in August. However, the severity of the climate crisis demands a broader scope with a focus on resilient economic development. So how can the IMF center economic development to build more resilient economies and encourage unprecedented global collaboration? What should the IMF's guiding principles be in addressing climate change as the fund embarks into a new policy landscape? Before, before turning it over to our panelists, I want to mention that this webinar is being live streamed on YouTube, so a recording is immediately accessible. Uh, to our audience, you can use the Q&A box located in your Zoom menu to ask your questions for the panelists. Uh, please also give your name and affiliation when asking questions. Um, we will take questions after the panelists' remarks, but feel free to enter your questions at any time during the discussion. Um, and joining us to discuss are four distinguished experts and members of the task force. Our first speaker is Amar Bhattacharya, a senior fellow in the Center for Sustainable Development 
housed in the Global Economy and Development Program at the Brookings Institution. Um, he has previously served as director of the Group of 24 and had a long-standing career in the World Bank. His last position was a senior advisor and head of the International Policy and Partnership Group. Amar, you have the floor. Um, thank you, Sarah. Um, it's a pleasure for me on behalf of Kevin Gallagher and uh, the group to present the overview of the strategy report. If I could please have the first slide. So um, this uh, strategy report, uh, you know, as uh, Sarah mentioned, uh, uh, focuses on a development-centered climate policy at the International Monetary Fund. Next slide. So the outline of the presentation is three parts. The need for such a development-centered climate action at the IMF. Second, what we consider the three elements of a comprehensive climate strategy, and then five principles to guide IMF climate policy. Next slide. Why a development-centered approach is important? Well, you know, as Sarah pointed out, you know, as the IPCC report has so strongly underlined, inaction by the world's major carbon emitters will have disproportionately high costs on developing countries. Uh, poor and uh, uh, climate vulnerable countries on their side need immediate focus on adaptation and resilience. And uh, very importantly, growth enhancing green structural transformation will need to be the cornerstone of all mitigation, adaptation and resilience strategies, thereby not only contributing to climate, but contributing to development. Next slide, please. So we know that you know climate uh, impacts have uneven uh, have uneven incidence, and as you can see, in terms of damage, in terms of disasters, and in deaths, the low income countries are particularly vulnerable, uh, and emerging markets and uh, more vulnerable than advanced economies. Next slide. Now we also know that we are not on a sustainable path. Uh, if we look at you know, what the uh, you know, announced policies have been, there is an improvement compared to the baseline, but it's still a scenario where global warming would take us to three degrees plus and thereby you know, put the planet at grave risk. And as you can see, in order to get a net zero path, there needs to be quite drastic adjustments. And not only does the path to net zero have to be achieved by 2050, but that path should be concave rather than convex. Next slide. So the effects, as you can see, in terms of an increase in temperature, and you can see this in terms of the colors, there is a very, very significant impact on real per capita output, very much concentrated in the South uh, and you know, disproportionately in many populous countries. Next slide. So we basically propose that the strategy to address this on the IMF side must encompass three elements that are anchored in its mandate. So the IMF's mandate, as Sarah pointed out, is growth and stability. That mandate hasn't changed, but what is clear now is that climate poses risks to both growth and stability. Hence the IMF needs to adjust its uh, now approach to climate and do so in three ways. First, in terms of global and national macro assessing the macroeconomic implications of climate risk. Second, in terms of the global and coordinated national policy frameworks. And third, the mobilization of resources for green and resilient growth. Next slide, please. So we see three elements uh, which are really anchored or based. Uh, 
on the instruments of the IMF. So the first is multilateral surveillance and with it global leadership on the climate agenda. The second is bilateral surveillance and with it capacity building. And the third is climate, a climate aligned finance toolkit. That means ensuring that the fund has the right instruments at the right scale to be able to support climate risks uh, and climate shocks. Next slide. So we uh, come for, we put forward five principles that we believe are important in guiding now the role of the fund and its agenda going forward. First, it must adopt the global role of addressing macroeconomic implications of climate risk climate action and asymmetries. The fund is, uh, for all the reasons that Sarah pointed out, you know, ideally suited to play that global role. Second, it must link in a very strong way and align the typical short-term stability concerns with the long-term sustainable resilience growth pathways and perspective. Third, of course, as always, you know, it must tailor its policy advice to member country circumstances, not a cookie cutter approach. Fourth, it must empower national and uh, stakeholder ownership of policy. Uh, and uh, uh, last, it must reconcile these, these shared climate goals with uh, equity and appropriate burden sharing. These, so these principles are crucial in getting a development-centered climate policy at the fund. And then the last slide, please. And what we need to do is ensure that these principles and the key elements of, of instruments that we talked about are well aligned. And that's what we propose in the paper. Uh, so thank you very much. Uh, back to you, Sarah. Great, thank you, Amar, for a very informative overview of the strategy report towards development-centered climate change policy at the International Monetary Fund. Moving on to our next speaker, uh, Daniel Teitelman, who is currently Director of the Economic Development Division at the United Nations Economic Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean. Previously, he served as the coordinator for the Special Studies Unit of the Executive Secretary of ECLAC and expert on monetary and, and financial policies. Mr. Teitelman has a long and substantive exp experience in macroeconomic and financial issues and has published numerous papers on these subjects. He's currently the focal point for financing for development issues in ACLAC. Daniel, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much. And um, first of all, I will uh, send Alicia Sparsen has greeting and her regrets for not being able to be here today with us. And I also would like the opportunity and the organization to launch this initiative. And I basically would like to complement and, and, highlight, and highlight some of the messages that Amar has put on the table, which I think are very important. The first one I would like to highlight very strongly is the idea that climate policy must be development centered in the sense that the fight against climate change is a development issue that has to address macroeconomic issues, short-term, medium-term, but in principle is a development issue. And as was Amar was saying, uh, climate change is a major challenge for all countries and flattening the global temperature curve in line with the ongoing commitments made as part of the Paris Accord will require a fundamental shift in production patterns as well as in the energy matrix that powers our economy. This will require important investment efforts and the mobilization of financial resources, a task that is particularly challenging in developing economies and emerging markets. In this sense, I welcome the work of the Task Force on Climate Policy for Development at the IMF that represents an important and tangible step towards building development and financing policies that respond to the needs of countries around the world in their efforts to tackle climate change. 
Building on rigorous empirical research, the task force is strongly positioned to promote policy strategies at the IMF that will have a long-term impact on climate change and development. We, while climate change is a global challenge, it, its impact is not equally borne by countries across the world, as Amar, Amar, Amar was implicating. In many cases, the most affected countries are those that are already in vulnerable conditions with populations that will see their way of life and well-being significantly impacted. These asymmetries also implies that countries irrespective of development level and income level, like lower income or middle income countries, can face significant burden in, in facing climate change issues. For example, Caribbean countries sit which are middle income countries or high income countries are very and highly vulnerable to climate change, resulting in outsized set needed for adaptation investment. So basically in the same way that countries do not have the similar capacities to respond to climate change. So I think that this is something very important to take into account when designing policy, which is the heterogeneity of countries capacity to respond to climate change at the same time that the vulnerability of countries is not necessarily linked to the GDP level. In Latin America, for example, public accounts were already in vulnerable state before the crisis, with shrinking fiscal space cutting into public investment levels. Looking forward, the potential for low, a potential grow, low region, that the region will be growing in a very slow matter accompanied by tightening financial market conditions suggests that available financing for development will be inadequate in the face of growing development and climate change needs. So one key element is how we're going to be able to mobilize the, the needed resources to face climate change, which is a very challenging task for many developing and emerging market economies. In this sense, and just to be finishing, I would like the, this opportunity to highlight some elements that we believe are crucial to address. First, as was mentioned, climate change is not just a macroeconomic issue, but it's a development issue with strong investment demand. It is very important to be aware of the challenges that developing economies, including middle-income countries, face in mobilizing financing for investment, especially in favorable conditions. For Latin America and the Caribbean, this is particularly pertinent, as overall investment levels in the regions are among the lowest in the world. And we estimated that GDP investment ratio is around 17% in 2020, compared to 32% of GDP for developing economies and emerging markets and 22 for advanced economies. Just to give you a flavor of the investment efforts these countries have to do to face climate change. Third, and the IMF initiative needs to address the inherent difference among countries. Developed and developing countries can, be, can have very different needs and capabilities when it comes to climate change adaptations. At the same time, new IMF policy must be proactive, seeking to address potential spillovers effects on the adoption adoption of climate change policy. Moving to a net zero emission paradigm will necessarily have a strong impact on fossil fuel exporting countries. These economies will face a double challenge, building fiscal capacity to offset hydrocarbon revenue losses while ramping up investment to transition to a lower carbon economy. So, and finally, we welcome the Resilient and Sustainability Trust Initiative that has been launched, uh, which marks a positive step towards creating additional financing options for countries as they respond to the COVID-19 crisis and seek to establish a transformative recovery. However, it is very important that this initiative does not hamper its effectiveness by excluding middle-income countries. The capacity to build resilience is not related to a country's GDP level, but rather is related to a, the degree of vulnerability of countries to climate change. I would like to conclude by congratulating this all the participants in this important international development effort to advance to climate adaptation agenda from a development perspective that takes into consideration needs of developing countries. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel, for your brief remarks. 
Uh, our next presenter is Madrun, Director of the Macro and Green Finance Lab at the National School of Development, Peking University, and the founder and president of the Institute of Finance and Sustainability based in Beijing. He's also the chairman of the Green Finance Committee of China Society for Finance and Banking, co-chair of the G20 Sustainable Finance Study Group, and co-chair of the Steering Committee of the Green Investment Principles for the Belt and Road. Madrin, you may take the floor. Thank you very much, Sarah. Uh, it's my great honor and pleasure to be part of the task force and part of this discussion. Uh, I think uh, my and Daniel have given the overview of the task force, so I will just touch upon a few specific issues that I believe the task force should be looking at. One is uh, uh, studying the macro implication of climate policy. And secondly, studying the uh, cross-border spillover effect of climate policy and certainly developing some analytical tools to uh, inform the uh, task force analysis. Um, on the first topic, uh, which is on macro implications, uh, uh, let me just give a quick review of what other international organizations are doing on sustainable finance and climate related policies. Uh, there are many of these, um, just uh, in the uh, G20 sustainable finance working group, which I co-chair um, this year, we now have at least 20 international organizations, initiatives, and uh, uh, networks participating. And uh, they are listed in the annex of the forthcoming G20 System of Finance Roadmap as uh, uh, partners and contribution contributors of these efforts. Just give you a few examples. Uh, the NGFS uh, is taking a leading role in identifying climate change as a source of financial risk and proposed a, a range of uh, scenarios for risk analysis. FSB uh, is designing the roadmap for addressing climate-related financial risks. And the IOSCO, uh, working with IFRS, is proposing to set up the ISSB, which is the uh, International Sustainability um, Standard Board. And IPSF, uh, the full name of that is International Platform for Sustainable Finance uh, is working on taxonomies, trying to improve in their uh, comparability, consistency. So lots of lots of efforts are going on. Now, my question is that what's missing uh, in this uh, international uh, community uh, working on climate-related policies and climate finance? I think uh, map implication is a missing link. Uh, we know that a lot of policies can potentially uh, help uh, different economies to decarbonize and uh, uh, the problem is that uh, we don't know how many policies will be in the plate and how these policies are combined to produce the aggregate result and how these policies, when they come into one combination would have an impact on GDP, on inflation, on income distribution, on jobs and so on. Uh, so that's a very important linkage. Uh, someone, some international organizations have to take up and uh, we feel that the IMF is probably in the best position uh, to uh, do this, given that uh, they have 3,000 economists. Uh, you know, I was there 20 years ago. I know there were 3,000 economists. I don't know how many they are today. But uh, uh, in terms of macro analysis capability, uh, IMF is definitely in the best position to do that. Um, now, specifically, what to analyze? As I mentioned, a couple of key indicators we need to understand. And the more importantly, it's a policy mix. Uh, by policy mix, I'm talking about uh, whether a country should be using carbon taxation, carbon pricing, um, whether they should be using regulatory policies such as uh, uh, limiting fossil fuel vehicles and uh, uh, increasing subsidies for renewable energies or uh, subsidies for you know, low carbon technologies using green finance policies such as in China, uh, we are about to put out uh, this decarbonization facility through which a central bank will offer cheap financing to low carbon activities. So all of these are possible tools. And uh, we don't know uh, when all of these come together in one go, uh, what's the impact? Are we gonna be decarbonizing enough or not enough? Are we gonna create a, a very positive impact on economy or negative impact on economy in the short term? Um, whether uh, these policies uh, implemented in a disorderly fashion will lead to a, a energy shortage such as what we are experiencing today. So these are the issues I think uh, IMF is in the best position to tackle. The second topic is on cross-border spillover effects. 
lot of aggressive climate related policy proposals are coming from developed countries with limited involvement from the developing world. We also know that uh, many of these policies are designed to have uh, macro critical impacts on other countries, not just on your own country. And uh, it's clear that uh, um, developing countries need help in decarbonization. They need help not only on you know, money, technology capacity, but also we wanna make sure that uh, policies adopted in other countries, uh, especially developed countries do not disproportionately burden the developing country and reduce their capacity to decarbonize in the longer term. Just give you one example, uh, the discussion of carbon border adjustment mechanism, uh, which are implemented in by uh, some countries or discussed by some countries, they can reshape the structure of international trade. And the, the trading partners with the carbon intensive exports, especially uh, the developing countries will suffer from uh, depressed demand, lost jobs, and the lower fiscal revenues if such mechanism is not properly designed. So these spillover effects will need to be uh, analyzed very carefully, especially the impact on balance of payments for developing countries. This also means that the designing climate policies without duly considering the developing world may end up with exacerbating the global inequality. And once again, I feel IMF is uniquely positioned to help identifying and addressing cross-border spillover effects and the vulnerabilities. Especially these effects uh, may impact the balance of payments, fiscal stability, and growth trajectory of vulnerable countries. The IMF can address this through reforming its multilateral surveillance functions and the spillover reports, as well as by its role in the G20 and other international fora. One of the major strengths of the IMF is uh, its in-house analytical capacity, and this capacity will enable the fund to develop a credible policy advice for the uh, global coordination process. And finally, just a few words on analytical tools. This task force, which is officially called Task Force on Climate Development and IMF, seeks to engage in rigorous research to help inform decisions and discussions. For example, one of the technical papers to be produced by task force is to use a dynamic CG model of which my team at Peking University is working on with partners to conduct a quantitative assessment of the impact of a carbon border adjustment tax on developing country uh, that are net exports of carbon and analyze the impact, uh, potential impact on distribution, income distribution. I'm hoping that this research will provide inputs for IMF policy recommendations on how to mitigate potential negative spillover effects through surveillance device and lending toolkit. Back to you, Sarah. That was very informative, informative to the discussion. Thank you, Majun. Um, last but definitely not least, uh, Dr. Abebe Shimelas in the direct, as a director of research at the African Economic Research Consortium. Dr. Shimelas brings over 30 years of experience in policy research for academia, NGOs such as Action Aid and other international organizations, including the United Nations Economic Commission for Africa, the World Bank, and the African Development Bank. His recent position at the African Development Bank was division manager of the Macroeconomy Policy Forecasting and Research Department. Abebe, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Sarah, for uh, uh, this uh, opportunity, the African Economic Research Consortium, uh, which I'm part of um, uh, in my current position, is one of the largest and oldest economic research think tanks uh, in Africa. And we are very happy to be part of this conversation. And uh, I thank also the GDP Center for organizing this uh, uh, webinar and also uh, giving us an opportunity to share the experience of Africa within the broader uh, strategy of uh, uh, bringing climate change uh, into the macroeconomic realm by the IMF. Well, uh, as, as the saying goes, better never, uh, never, uh, better let than never. Uh, for African countries uh, with which I have worked 
for almost uh, the last uh, two, three decades. I can tell you that uh, uh, the movement towards uh, uh, green and inclusive growth uh, has been actually at the height of uh, policy vibe uh, around mid 2000, actually until the 2009 economic crisis, which uh, basically rolled back any interest on climate change issues. And many African countries felt betrayed at the time uh, because most of them had been really pressured and uh, influenced by the global community to look into the climate change issues in their development strategy. Uh, and then, you know, the, the financial crisis came uh, and then the agenda has been uh, parked uh, somewhere. And now we are picking it up because we realize um, the situation is getting really serious. So uh, from the African perspective, I think everyone has said, Amar mentioned it, uh, Daniel also said, low income countries, including Africa, contributed quite little to the uh, climate change situation, but yet uh, bear the, the brunt of uh, the full impact of the climate change shocks uh, in Africa. I've been coordinating the African Economic Outlook every year uh, to look at the uh, uh, outlook for Africa's macroeconomic uh, uh, situation. And I can tell you, uh, there is no time where one region or another part of Africa has not been affected by climate change shocks, whether it is drought, whether it is flooding, whether it is conflict, whichever one pick, uh, it plays out uh, in the continent. Uh, and as a result, the impact on GDP growth has been very well known. I think many governments recognize uh, they need to address that. Uh, the African Economic Research Consortium, actually, we had last March uh, this year, uh, a meeting with central bank governors of about 15 countries, uh, where we initiated uh, uh, a discussion uh, for governments in Africa to embed climate change into their macroeconomic management. But now the, the issue is the tools are not available. So uh, one of, I think the advantage of having the IMF climate change strategy is to allow and probably work together with developing countries such as in Africa uh, to um, have uh, models that can help governments make decisions about, for instance, the valuation of their assets, the risk of climate change, how much they can borrow. And also, most importantly, uh, currently we are working with GDP here uh, with this network, is the impact on the monetary variables of uh, the economy. The real part, everybody knows, when, uh, when you are hit by floods, uh, people die, they lose lives, they lose property, they lose livelihoods. But more than that, in the aggregate, uh, prices also change. And those prices can affect also the lives of households, especially poor households, particularly children. We have done a lot of studies on that related to climate shocks uh, that, that affect uh, children even in the embryo. People who were born at the time of severe climatic shocks, especially droughts, uh, tend to have a much, much lower growth rates and all of those uh, associated things. So for Africa, it's a matter of survival, more than managing their economy. So climate change must be uh, an imperative for understanding uh, the path uh, for inclusive uh, development. So in this exercise, um, we've had very little uh, understanding how the interaction between the climate change uh, especially changes in temperature or other processes to capture uh, the climate change shocks and the uh, macroeconomic stability and its implication, of course, for financing. So all of these uh, related factors, um, earlier uh, Ma mentioned about DSG. Actually, we, I, when I was back in the African Development Bank, we developed uh, uh, what we call a debt investment growth model especially for those natural resource rich countries to understand 
um, the trade-off they will be facing if they continue to exert pressure on the fossil fuel uh, to finance their development. Uh, so basically, I think Africa is very much aware of the risks. The question is, how do you make this transition manageable? And also, how is the global partnership going to work uh, if uh, uh, African countries are going to commit uh, to the uh, initiatives that we are uh, seeing in, a, uh, which is presented in front of us. So there is so much I think uh, Africa is expecting from uh, this initiative. Uh, thank you, Sarah. Uh, thank you so much for your brief remarks, Abele. Uh, now that we are done with the overview of the strategy paper and policy brief, as well as remarks from some of our task force members, I will now open the floor for a question and answer. Uh, again, to those who joined us today via Zoom, uh, please use the Q&A box located in your Zoom menu to ask your questions for the panelists. Please also give your name and affiliation. Um, I see we have so far seven questions in the chat box, so perhaps we can go with the first one. Um, Martin Rabia from KU Leuven, do you foresee a role for conditional loans? There is evidence of environmental conditionality in, in a few IMF loans, for example, Costa Rica's EFF and resilience. Um, if a task force member would like to take that, I will also read a, another question uh, so we could do two questions at a time. Um, so this is from Yolanda Fresnillo, um, affiliation not mentioned, um, but the question is, uh, the strategy report includes the need to incorporate physical and transition risks and the need for a stepwise increase in resource mobilization into Debt Sustainability Analysis, the DSA. Um, this has been a long-term call from civil society, not only in relation to climate and transition risks and needs, but also in relation to human rights and public service. But in many occasions, it's been raised that such reform could lead to increases of borrowing costs for developing countries. Without an efficient debt restructuring mechanism in place that ensures fair burden sharing among creditors, following what we could call climate and human rights sensitive DSAs, how can we address the capital costs in increasing risks? So I leave it with those two questions. Um, task force members, uh, feel free to, to unmute your microphones and, and jump in. Well, I'm happy to take, uh, take uh, to start. Um, so on uh, our preference is that IMF lending support should not be conditionality driven. Um, we do want uh, actions at the country level, but you know this is a long-term agenda. And in some sense, the support should be in some sense given to those countries that are prepared to take those actions, but not on the basis of a, a standard conditionality-based program. Uh, there will also be great country specificity, as we mentioned in, the, in, one of our, in one of our guiding principles. So our, our preference, uh, strong preference would be that the IMF support and the climate agenda by its nature, uh, if it is going to be development and long-term oriented, should not be based on uh, standard IMF conditionality. Um, I also uh, think that uh, in, in terms of uh, the support that the IMF gives, um, uh, you know, it's the domain, its domain, of course, doesn't extend to some of the dimensions that people have mentioned. That's not really in the, you know, the human rights dimension, domain is not in the IMF, uh, you know, reach. But of course, you know, the IMF has to be very much concerned about impacts that any support it has on human rights and on climate justice. Thank you, Amar. And, and just to address the cost of capital um, issue uh, in the, um, the Resilience and Sustainability Trust paper that the task force has come out with, it does mention that um, perhaps uh, the RST uh, could support debt restructuring by providing collateral to guarantee restructured debt. Um, the guarantee could, could thus reduce the cost of capital. 
uh, for, for countries. Uh, the link to this brief is also in the, um, in the chat box. Um, and with that, we'll move to a couple of more questions. Um, Luisa Galvao from, uh, don't see the affiliation as well, but uh, the, the question is, how do you propose that national and stakeholder ownership of policies could be increased? Uh, specifically relating to principle four in the presentation. Um, and then I can maybe go on to another question as well. Um, climate change, ex-farmers and vulnerable groups in the society more so than others. What is the IMF doing to ensure those that are most impacted by climate change are prioritized in policy formulation and implementation? And this is the question by Dr. Uh, Amatuyol Ambali. Um, colleagues from the task force, in case you'd like to jump in, uh, please feel free to do so. Yes, Daniel, please go ahead. Yeah, I would like to address a little bit the question in terms of national ownership, which I think is a very important element. And I think that has two key elements. One, as was mentioned, the fight against climate change and the adaptation and mitigation. And the new demands for investment require a development strategy. And those development strategy must be built from national perspective. So I think that if national governments and, and the design of the development strategy to build a, a more resilient economy and society for climate change issues and address the climate change issues requires uh, that this comes from a country development strategy perspective, which will strengthen the ownership of these policies. And at the same time, as then also been mentioned, taking into account the specificity of national conditions in terms of financing needs or in terms of investment demands will also build up ownership of this type of policies. So basically the message is that these policies have a global impact, require a multilateral approach, but this multilateral approach must be must take into account national conditions, national needs, and how countries begin to develop a development strategy uh, will, will strengthen the, the ownership of these policies at the national level. Great. Thank you, Daniel. Um, colleagues? In case you'd like to jump in, uh, please feel free to do so. Okay, I think uh, then Daniel, since, since we have you on the line, uh, there's a question specifically for you here. Um, the question is, in your presentation, you mentioned that there is a need to create additional financing options for countries that are severely affected by the impact of climate change. I would like to know how governments of those countries do that because these countries are highly constrained with finance due to the impact of COVID-19. Could you please shed light on how these governments could do, could approach this or could do this? Well, yes, I think that that's a key element and we've been discussing this a lot and it has different perspectives. One is of course, how countries can strengthen their fiscal space to, to, have, uh, to, to be able to support all the at least public investment it will be required and also uh, support private investment that will also will be required for climate change issues. And strengthening the fiscal space, at least in, in, in the Latin American region and, and I think in other regions has different tasks. One is to eliminate tax avoidance and tax solution which in the case of Latin America, it amounts around 6.1% of regional GDP, which is around 325 billion of dollars, which is a lot of money. So countries have to strengthen their efforts to reduce tax avoidance and tax solution. And we are now being on the, reading on the papers, the Pandora box, which is an example. Of, there is a lot of work to do in tax avoidance and tax solution. Secondly, uh, our countries do need to have tax reforms that will strengthen and increase not only the level of fiscal incomes, but also the progressivity of our tax structures. That's also a, a national task that countries have to move on. But for doing that, we do need collaborations from global uh, institutions. 
it's not easy for a, a, a country to fight tax evasion and tax evasion if we don't have a more global perspective like BEPS is putting on or the flat tax rate, global flat tax rate. I mean, this, the country efforts have to be complemented with multilateral efforts. Also, it is very important that multilateral, the capacity to mobilize financial resources, the excess liquidity we're observing in the world to mobilize it to finance fiscal space and investment in developing and emerging countries is also very important to strengthen fiscal capacity. So I will say we have a mixture of national policies and tax avoidance and also increasing the tax base and, the tax, and improving the tax structure. But these policies have to be complemented from a multilateral perspective in terms of a more fiscal transparency, more financial transparency, helping countries to fight against tax evasion. And at the same time, all the initiatives like the redistribution of SDRs, like the phase fund proposed by the Costa Rican to mobilize resources from the global international financial market to finance and investment in developing and emerging economies is also very important to strengthen the capacity of mobilizing resources. Thank you. Great, thank, thank you, Daniel. Um, I'm afraid we've, we've run out a bit of time, but, but perhaps uh, we can take one, if there's time at the very end, maybe we do one more question. Um, uh, but you know, thanks again to the audience uh, for your participation. We take note of all the other questions that we have on the chat. I believe there may be over a dozen left. Um, but we are uh, at the end um, of this session. Uh, and now it is my pleasure to introduce uh, Marilu Uy of the G24 for the closing remarks. Marilu, you have the floor. Um, hold on. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, thank you, Sarah. It's, um, it's a privilege to be part of this initiative um, driven by uh, global, the Global Development Policy Center and to be here with you today. Um, well, thank you all for the excellent remarks. Uh, the panelists certainly provided an overview of the elements of a development-friendly climate strategy. They highlighted the major challenges that developing countries are and will be facing as they pursue their development and climate goals. So building on the panel's discussion, let me close with a few comments on what lies ahead for this initiative to promote, to promote a development-friendly uh, climate policies at the IMF. Now, the panel laid out two areas of work of high importance to developing countries. First, a key message from developing countries, including G24 members, is the important role of international financial institutions in supporting countries meet both development and global climate goals. Investments will need to spur growth and development that is sustainable environmentally and socially. Now, and such support from international financial institutions must clearly be tailored to countries' diverse economic structures and circumstances. The path to low carbon development will not be the same for all developing countries. Thus, we are encouraging analytical work that will improve understanding, easier said than done, of the adaptation needs of climate, climate vulnerable countries and transition paths to decarbonize economies in face of multiple macroeconomic risks that countries face and the impact of policy mixes on the real economy. Now, for those undertaking structural transformation to transition to a low carbon economy, the types of and scale of the macro critical challenges will depend on structures and initial conditions. Commodity dependent countries, for example, and countries that are still in early stages of transition or even the midst of industrialization will most likely have different development and transition paths. Now in this context, the analytical work meant much of it you've heard, um, you know, you've heard from the panelists will delve on more granular analysis and assessments of specific challenges to accelerating climate actions and what would be entailed to ensure a just transitions in specific settings. As you heard from our panelists, we are fortunate to be collaborating with excellent think tanks working in, diverse set, in a diverse set of developing countries and regions. Now, as Danielle mentioned during the discussion, the fiscal and macroeconomic impact of a fossil fuel transition will be a key area of focus. Our colleagues from India, who are not with us today, will similarly focus on fiscal impacts in their own country contexts. 
Now, ABEB esteem will highlight areas and sectors that require immediate attention to manage the impact of climate change in ways that promote development and improve livelihoods in Africa. So we hope that these pieces of analytical work going forward will help inform possible ways or possible uh, approaches for the IMF to tailor their advice and financial support to country and regional circumstances. Now, a six, second key message is the need to address spillovers of climate action, as Majun mentioned. This is relevant to our regional and country level analysis, but is truly important also for the multilateral surveillance work of the IMF and for addressing the challenge of policy coordination. Multilateral policy coordination, or even between countries, will need to involve mitigating adverse spillovers, cognizant, particularly cognizant of their impact on development. Now, finally, additionally, finding the means for IMF to be part of climate finance solutions to support a just global transition will be an important consideration. This will require new efforts and tools, especially given the need for financing over the longer term than, the, than what the existing IMF toolkit could provide. So revisiting its toolkit to support climate goals will be a, a step going forward, albeit a difficult one to do. Now, going forward, we also look to advancing this work and hope that these analyses could eventually inform discussions among country policymakers, IMF colleagues, and international organizations. We look forward to continuing this conversation with you as this work evolves and with IMF member countries, fund staff, and the various stakeholders working to align the financial system with climate and development goals. Now, before closing, let me say that promoting climate policies that serve development will be highly rele relevant to the IMF, but also to other international financial institutions. Each one, of course, will have to work within the respective uh, operational roles and mandates. Now, IFIs are important sources of technical advice, policy, policy advice, and financing for developing countries. All will need to scale up support for development-friendly transitions to a greener and a more resilient world. So with these concluding remarks, let me once again thank all our panelists for sharing their thoughts with us today and to everyone who joined this discussion. Um, to all participants to receive updates on publications and events as this work evolves, you can of course subscribe uh, to the, to the uh, updates, to receive updates from the Task Force on Climate Development and the IMF. The G GDP Center will upload the, the link in the chat. And thank you, and over to you, Sarah, for the final closing. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mary Lou, for your points um, and very important summary of what the task force will be going to do in the next uh, few months. Um, well, the next 18 months, <laughs> to be clear. <laughs> um, so uh, because we, we have a couple of minutes, um, there is a, we, we see in the chat, uh, there's, there's quite a lot of questions, uh, but there's one final question that I think encompasses uh, a lot of the questions generally is, um, uh, could panelists perhaps discuss a little more the resilience and sustainability trust proposals uh, from the task force, just, just very briefly as we have four minutes before close. Uh, happy, to, happy to say something. So the, uh, the motivation behind the resilience and sustainability trust is that the IMF needs to engage in three different dimensions of the challenge that uh, emerging markets and developing countries face. One is the higher incidence and costs of shocks. The second is the challenge around you know, building resilience and particularly making a big push on adaptation in vulnerable countries. And the third, is helping to meet adjustment costs of energy transition in sister, you know, in, in countries, all countries, but especially systemically important countries, including the accelerated phase out of coal. So, you know, these are of course very much in the domain of the multilateral development banks, but the IMF also has a crucial role to play. And you know, having a, 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 a fund that can enable the IMF to support emerging markets and developing countries as part of its uh, lending toolkit would be extremely valuable. And the policy brief that you know, we prepared makes the case for such a trust. 
at this point in time using the reallocation of SDRs. Thank you, Amar. And um, in case any other colleagues uh, would like to add any points, this is your, your final minute to do so. Just to complement a little bit what Amar just said, and, uh, and one of the key issues of this type of resilient fund is that it should address macroeconomic, short-term macroeconomic issues, but also investment issues. And it's very important that these type of funds we are able to support macroeconomic stability at the same time that are able to mobilize finance for investment. And in that respect, this is also a very important part of the objective of this type of funds. And in this, basically, I just wanted to complement with that. Thank you, Daniel. Um, and thank you very much to the panelists uh, for sharing your thoughts with us today. And I would like to uh, remind attendees as well that this has been recorded on YouTube uh, and we will share the link on the chat. Uh, thanks to uh, GDP and colleagues as well for sharing the relevant information on the chat. Um, and again, thank you uh, and we will see you next time. Have a good day, everyone.